as I was thinking about leaving the last chapter behind and the talk about web-based or PC-based apps or system design, I was thinking about my experience of what long-term, what kind of repercussions there are, or what kind of things you have to deal with if you're going to do a web-based application versus a PC-based application. So first of all, <clears throat> I think the book leaned toward everyone's going web-based interfaces. And I think that's true, but why do people leave the PC-based apps and go web-based? What's some advantages? Yeah, you can access it anywhere. And what's required on the client side? Browser. Just a browser, yeah. So yeah. you could choose your browser. Now, what browsers do, will they be choosing? Chrome. Chrome, top of the list. And I think if we look at the, at the browser wars numbers, I think Chrome is at the top. What comes next? I think Firefox is next. Internet Explorer is has dropped way down. Safari is there for the Mac people, but even Mac people are starting to use Chrome. Uh, you can actually get uh, Internet Explorer for Mac, and you can get Safari for PC. Uh, Chrome is everywhere, and it's on my mobile device too. So what issues do we have to deal with with mobile apps? Yeah, like that. yeah, break. yeah. Browsers break, browsers change, and yet the users are still going to use. There's your some of your customers are still going to be using an old browser because they're on their XP machine and their farmhouse or in the basement where they don't want to spend money. They just need to get to the website, and yours is one of their websites, and you don't want to break it for them. So. The hassle on the website or the web-based app is compatibility with all these browsers. But what's one other big thing you have to worry about for web-based apps? Besides the customers, the nice customers that wanting to get to your site with their whole variety of browsers and mobile browsers, you've got to have mobile app enabled sites now. You have to detect if they're mobile and change the whole look because normal site doesn't look very well very good on an iPhone or an Android. But what about the bad people out there? There's, sadly, there's bad people out there. What do they do? Yeah, they're trying to hack your site. They're trying to find security flaws. So what do you have to do with your software? You're constantly updating security updates on your exposed website. So, web-based application has the advantage of not being dependent on what's running on the PC, except for the browser version. So on the PC, there's a lot more things to worry about than browser versions. And so people go to the web apps, but then they realize, wait a minute, I am now exposing my website to the entire internet, and there's people that just, they love to, I don't know if they're paid to do it, they love to try to hack sites. So if you use a common package to try to save some money to build your site, like Drupal or WordPress or even our Moodle software, if people learn about a vulnerability in that particular package, guess what? You're on their list of sites using that, and they can, whenever they feel like it, come in, unlock your system, and hack it. Even secure, fairly, you know, software that's known to be very, fairly secure has been hacked. So that's the hassle of the web. You're constantly getting notices, time to update your software. And you're doing networking and firewalls. I'm sure that we have to keep up with updating our firewall software. And actually, there is an update for PFSense. I have to figure out how to install it without bringing down the firewall. So that's, that's the bad side of web-based. A lot of security issues constantly updating. Now, what's 
going on on the PC client side? What's bad there and what's good there? What's the hassle of developing for a PC? Just like you had multiple browsers, what do you have to deal with? Yeah, operating system. You might just say, okay, customers, if you want to run our software, here's what you need. And often you'll see the list. Windows 8 or above, or Windows 7 or above. And, sorry, there's no Mac version. Go run PC inside of your Mac if you want to run this. And so I'm dealing with that with a lot of software. I have VirtualBox on my Mac. I'm too cheap to buy Parallels, which I've heard from people who use it, like it better than VirtualBox. Um, but it's a way to run PC inside of a Mac. But if you're a developer and your customers say, you know, I'm running Parallels and I can't get your software to work. And everyone else is using Windows, vanilla Windows, and it's working. Guess what you have to do? <laughs> Try to debug what's going on and you have to learn that maybe they're running some special setting inside of Parallels that breaks it. So for PC-based apps, just like for the web-based, you're making sure it's compatible with multiple browsers. On the PC, you're trying to make your software compatible at least with the version, the most common version of Windows or OS that's available, and then keeping it backward compatible as you may have to fix it for new versions of Windows because you want your system to be compatible. And that's where if you've done your software right, and that's where using common routines, don't do super customized things in software that's like some people, some real geeky people can get down to the actual right assembly language code. Have you heard, you know what assembly language is? It's like really low level PC commands may make your code to go super fast, but guess what? The next version of Windows or the next version of Visual Studio doesn't support that. They were never expecting and they tell people don't do that because it's going to break the next version, and sure enough, it will. So you have to really program it carefully using standard libraries. That was another thing that happened to me a while back. Someone was writing an interface. They wanted me to help them out. So the first thing I did, I'd say, give me your code. I'll try to compile it on my Mac so I can then modify the code. It took me a week just to get their code to compile because they were using, and they, of course they hadn't documented a thing anywhere, of here's how you build this project. It's, oh, here's the code. Actually, the programmers were sort of gone by then, and the, and the guy that supposedly knew handed me the code and said, yeah, this should work. And it wouldn't compile, and so I, we had to get messages back to the original guy. I said, oh, yeah, you need this extra library. Well, I want to get that latest version of that, of course. The latest version was broken. It's two years old version of it is what they were working with. And of course, it was just a nightmare. And their software quickly went away. So it was a sad thing. But that's, a, that's why you get away from PC stuff. There's a lot of troubles there. But what's the safe thing about PC apps? Do you have to worry about people over the internet attacking you? No, you've, you, your customers that you've delivered your software to have it, and those are the only people you have to worry about. And as you get pirated versions out there of uh, people that love your software so much that they're trying to pirate it, well, that's going to be a shorter list than the entire Internet. And you may be able to at least get some support dollars from them, even if they have pirated versions there at some point if they need you they may be directing a business your way, realizing you have good software, and yeah, I've been using your pirated version, you'll know that they're not going to tell you, but at least you're getting customers. And if you write the code right, it will, you can either know that they're using it, but haven't paid you, and have a way to gently uh, bring them in as a customer, or you can write in things that it uh, works for a month and then, and then quits or slows way down, or some way to, to protect yourself. So you have to worry about pirating if you've written really good software, 
But if it's just a user interface software that directs you to back to your site, then it's there's nothing there that's really you're not losing money. It's directing you to your business if it's working right. Then that's why a lot of companies will give away their demo version and then bring in customers because it's good software. They'll come buy your industrial strength version that they will pay for. So just the final remarks regarding the development and basically life is going to be hard either way you have just to be familiar with the different uh, world that you're in. PC based is a little safer world but it's a smaller world. Uh, but if your customers are all using Windows and you have the expertise to build a decent program using Visual Studio or some, there's a lot of great open source packages like NetBeans. You can do tons of stuff with that. And you're paying time for the programmer or doing that yourself. Where on the internet, you have a lot of capabilities, but you also are out there in the dangerous world of constant updates to websites and keeping track of browsers. Okay, the topic now, and let's look at our schedule here. I have also adjusted our schedule slightly because I realized we're a little behind and I had also not had the break in the right spot. So if we look at our assignment schedule here, I've bumped up a few things. I'm thinking we can get through with major part of output and user interface design today, working through a quick little project and then finishing that up next, well, after Easter break, and then getting into data design. And I'm not sure why I have that in bold. Maybe it's just a really special time. Oh, and I wanted to have a little quiz today. Just going over, I think I might have a short one. Maybe we'll make the user interface design our quiz. So, Let's quickly go over user interface design principles. And I have the PowerPoint here. I did have it up. There it is. The book has lots, well, the, the PowerPoint available for you there uh, has lots of interesting things in about what we want to learn from this chapter. I'm going to jump ahead and focus on the graphical user interface design. But let's at least go over some of the output ideas that are mentioned in this chapter where when you're developing a, a system it has to generate output. Uh, we want to uh, design good output and some of the <coughs> ideas behind output like writing uh, printing reports goes the same for graphical on-screen reports is how people read that the human-computer interaction and remembering the user that is something that us techies are accused of and is often true we don't think about the end user we think about how we use it and of course we're the experts on our systems and we ignore all the problems because we've looked at that same screen a thousand times and I've gotten used to ignoring the goofy thing that happens when you click here or put your mouse here or type the wrong thing in Guess what? Your users don't know all that. So if you're going to have good user-centered design, make a or pay a regular person to check out your system. Or trade it, have a friend of yours that is very good at breaking things to try your system and find where it breaks. And you'll find some people are just really good at that. They'll know to go type here and then type here. Sometimes it's doing it really fast typing in something you would never really expect someone to type, but maybe you do have a user that's actually just trying to break your system to break in. You need to test it for that. And there's some basic guidelines we're going to jump to. Variety of guidelines about where you, how you design your screens, some ideas about uh, validation checks. Remember, our data is worthless if it's invalid data. So when they type something in, like the state that they're in in an address bar, you give them a pull down instead of typing that in, because they may accidentally type the wrong two letters. That would avoid the problem of validation check. This is something you'd like to skip if you can. Make it friendly enough, but do a validation check. Make sure it's correct results. 
if you had an address thing, a, a cool thing we, that you can almost do online now is if they type in an address, quick do a validation, is that a valid address, a valid mailing address? And you can come back and say, wait a minute, did you, are you sure you typed something right? We're not having that address show up as a valid address. Anything you can do in a friendly way for providing good uh, usable input, uh, user interface. So they kind of separate into two parts, where they have output design first. Thinking of producing reports or information for users, uh, customers, or for management. Now thinking about our TIM system, what kind of output design would be involved in our TIM's training information management system? what outputs would either students or instructors or system admins or accounting system, what kind of output would be provided? Grades. Yeah, grades. A grade, here's your grade results. And that would be a great report to design. What should a grading report look like? Now, we don't have to work in a vacuum although it's kind of fun to work from scratch sometimes to see if I were doing it completely on my own what would it look like but out there in the real world you kind of look for examples you've already seen of good grading reports and <coughs> you can work from that say you know I could use this same grading report but maybe adjust this because this part of it bugs me so what's, what would be a good example you could work from for a grading report Do you get grading reports for your work here? Yeah, so you could go to your Empower pages, bring that up, and if you say, you know, this Empower page works exactly the way I expect, I could design my page to pretty much duplicate what they're doing in Empower, the same arrangement of things. Uh, are you happy with how they get reported in Empower? Is it usable? generally logical you could follow that same order and maybe maybe choose different because of your user interface design maybe you wouldn't have the same fonts or exact same arrangement but you could very much follow a good design so that's something don't be afraid to do you can always uh, take a working design and start with that and then embellish it with maybe a little easier on the eyes uh, fonts larger or smaller sections here or there that you think maybe I I want to focus on this and that's one of the user interface design principles is focusing providing the most valuable information first either on the left side since we're English reading left to right and top to bottom the most useful information upper left generally and most of the time there's a title across the top and a footer for, for information that's kind of constant throughout the report. The inside of it is the high value information. So as you design something, of course you want to be based on having some kind of purpose, why the information is needed, of course providing the information they do need. Don't, don't leave out important information. When it's output and input, which I think is more common with the web interface, don't make the things that are only for output to be editable at all. Sometimes I've been to pages where I look at something and, and it looks like I'm supposed to change it, then I realize, wait a minute, they're just providing that for information. They should have made that a label rather than something that looks like I can edit it. Always be aware of your user's need for the information. When do they need it? Are there issues with not only the user looking at it, especially on a web screen, but if somebody's looking over their shoulder, do you want them seeing that? And so with passwords interface, asking for, for typing in your new password, unless you specifically click the show the text, it doesn't even show the password because they may be changing their password when 
someone else may happen to be looking and they'd rather keep their password confidential. Or entering a credit card. Make that uh, something that doesn't sit there and display the entire time. You have them enter it and then it turns into stars with the last four numbers because you want them to be able to type it in but not have it sit there for anyone else to see walking by. So here's the various types of output. I'm going to be concentrating on the, uh, the web-based type output. Email and blogs, I think that's something that is a lot more flexible. Don't go crazy with your emails. I think if you generally follow the, a standard memo type format, a basic polite letter, emails can be very nice. Uh, the time you worry about good email design, if perhaps you're doing a broadcast to your customers of information, you want to have that well-designed, professional looking. Where if it's a personal email, generally a lot more flexible in your formatting. Instant messaging, I doubt there's a whole lot of structure involved there. Not sure what they mean by wireless devices and output design. They go through a variety of outputs that your system can generate. Uh, in our TIM system, would we pre be providing any of these kinds of outputs? Digital audio. You could have a help page with a, here's how to use our system, welcome. And on the, let me bring one up, an example of that. I have not actually seen this, but I've heard it's there. Let me go to, is it, is it eLearn? I think it's the eLearn site. Let's try this. Video tutorial, how to log in. Let's take a look at our video tutorial and see if this is decent. You can critique our video tutorial. I'll bring it up. New tab here. Welcome to Emmaus Distance Learning. This short video will demonstrate how to log into your course. First, you'll see that I've gone to the address elearn.emmaus.edu, which brings me to this page. In the top right corner, I'll select Login and enter my username and my password. and then select login. This brings me to the main page and I will select this link to enter my first course. You'll notice here on the center of the page is important course information. Uh, note that under required readings these links will take you to that specific resource. Also notice here on the right hand side the calendar with upcoming events or assignments. There you go. A quick little video. I think on the web now, whenever I go to YouTube, I'm looking for instructional, I will gravitate toward the things that are five minutes or less. So I don't feel like watching an hour unless I know I've been, yeah, I've been digging through a particular topic and I know this person has a great presentation. Otherwise, I prefer tutorials that give me five minutes, then a part two of ten. I'm happy to go with parts and I, that lets me have some control over the part I'm viewing. So I would say when you're thinking about user interface design with uh, digital audio video, follow the uh, make it short but multiple pieces. I'd, I'd say the same thing goes for podcasts. Faxes are starting to uh, go away, but uh, if you're doing faxing, you want to have some good formatted professional looking things coming out of fax machines. Microfilm, that's uh, not sure who's using that these days, but it's on our list. Output to digital media, not sure what they actually mean. There's so many possibilities of digital media. So a variety of outputs and now as you get into more screen-based reports, one thing to do, one thing to remember about screen output, even though most of the time you're not going to design for the printer, your users may need to print things that they're viewing. 
especially with invoices or that grading report that they want to put in their file to mail, you want to have a way of generating printer-friendly output, not just print the pager on, because often the pager on will have sidebars everywhere that you don't need printed. So most good sites that I go to when I need a printout, they're very nicely, they'll have a little printer icon somewhere, pr uh, printer-friendly, and it focuses on just what I need printed out for a transcript or a class schedule. Those are the kinds of things you want to think about as you design your user interface. The book goes into detail about arranging things on a report in nice columns. Things lined up vertically and horizontally are always easy on the eyes. So use your tabs or table format, if you're doing web pages, to line things up. Totals and subtotals, put in a uh, either bold font or, a, or lines to mark the end of a section beginning some more information. Just general good practices. I think it'll, and that's where you, working with output that has been helpful to you, use the same kind of layout. And again, get feedback from users. And they give a, a variety of, of ideas about uh, avoiding problems as you design things. Get input as you go rather than having to come back and redesign everything. And again, if you have a lot of things and you're giving it to someone for feedback, they're going to avoid saying something about it if they realize, you know, this is on all of your reports. Unless they're a passionate person, they're going to overlook that knowing, oh, that's a lot of work for them. I, maybe I won't say that. And you'll send it through with a horrible flaw over everything because you waited till, till it lasts to get feedback. Get feedback as you go. And even from your customers. Don't be afraid to work with a customer. Maybe they give them a discount for spending more time with you to help you approve your designs. If you're working with a customer that's demanding a schedule, remember to give them input and it, tell them their feedback is going to affect your schedule. That might give them incentive to give you prompt feedback about any issues. And tell them if they don't give you feedback and make sure they sign off on, hey, this is an okay design, because in the end, if you start getting flack about some poor interface design, you can come back and say, wait a minute, your reviewer told us it was okay. Look, we have the form to show. So do your proper homework and paperwork as you go. Then at the end, if the boss doesn't like it of, the, of your customer, you can show, wait a minute, you gave approval along the way. We followed uh, feedback, and then the boss can get mad at that person. They weren't doing their job. That uh, you have... And of course, as if you're a friendly uh, uh, company, you'll try to, to make that, and, and it may go with, well, it's going to take a little longer than schedule because you didn't give us the right feedback. So I think some fairly obvious ideas about laying out the design and putting things in logical, consistent order. Don't make every page look different than the other. Header across the top with title about what this is. One thing that drives me crazy is often I'll get reports and it doesn't show the date the report was printed. And you come back a year later and you see the report and you wonder, wait a minute, is this last month or is this a year ago, January? So add those details and those are things that can go in headers and footers. Documents that we revise. Another thing that bugs me is they don't put the revision date around anywhere. And so you're looking at documents and say, uh, these are the changes from uh, last year that have been approved. And I'm thinking, okay, where are the changes? Well, it's I supposed to have the form memorized to automatically recognize changes. But uh, very common thing for people not to do. They just say, here's the new form, approve the changes. And I have no clue what the changes are. So I just approve it. In your outputs, keep in mind they should be secure. 
don't print out so, uh, in, uh, private information on hard copies like social security numbers. Very common for people just to print the last four. Same with credit cards. Don't have those on printed documents. And still, uh, if you're handling documents, be careful about security measures. Uh, with accounting, that's a bigger deal because people are sensitive about who knows wh what about whose salaries. Okay, they talk about user interface design and how it is user-centered and having an understanding of basic human-computer interaction and principles. I'm just going to jump to the eight principles they recommend here. I'm going to jump over the, the user rights thing. I think that's very reasonable. Basically, make sure you're, you have the perspective of your user again. That's what the, a lot of that is about. I'm going to jump down to the eight guidelines, and then we'll jump to creating our own and see if we can follow these eight guidelines, which are, again, fairly... I'd say fairly obvious, but it's good to have a list to, to check, check on are you following these. Keep it simple. Focus on your basic objectives. If you're getting a login, let's do the login. And that brings up a cool, well, interesting, I thought it was somewhat interesting video. This guy with, he needs braces, but sounds like a very smart guy. Has done some user interface and is a blogger. And kind of interesting what he says. And where's my audio? Is that the audio? Oh, maybe I'll go to the page that has the audio. Uh, this was is also on YouTube, so let me go to the YouTube page. Now why YouTube has goofiness? Here we go. So I'm moving back. Not because another bank has offered me some better deal. I'm moving bank because I'm fed up with the user experience of my current bank's mobile app. It's terrible. There isn't anything serious. I'm going to jump the ahead app. to it's the not actual. Broken as such, oh, it's not too long. As I use the app so many times a day, and the little things begin to grate me with that level of use. Using their app feels like death by a thousand cuts, and so. I saw the alternative and I thought, I've got no choice. I have to swap. You see, user experience matters. Matters enough to motivate people to move from one supplier to another. It's not even the big usability issues, it's the little things that build up to make a bigger problem. It's constantly dealing with the same little annoyance that never seems to get fixed. To show you what I mean, I want to walk you through the process of logging in to two separate banking apps, First Direct and Barclays. Now, we're just talking about logging in here, something that should be incredibly simple and straightforward. And logging into the Barclays mobile app is in fact a pleasure. You launch the app and enter your five digit PIN. No keyboard to fiddle with, just a clear numerical pad. For added security, they display an authentication phrase so that you know it's Barclays that you're logging into and that you've not been hacked or anything. Compared to that, First Direct is a nightmare. Upon launching the app, you see a series of options and it forces you to click on an extra button before you can get to the login screen. Now you could argue that people dog into the app itself. There. Uh, let's see if I can go back to where he, 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 or he did such a short show of that one. There it is. It doesn't look that bad to me. I mean, just one extra button to click. But like he said, extra little thing just bugged in. It came up very quickly. So let's see. Instead of it coming to the login, you have to click here to do the login. Doesn't seem like a big deal to me. Click on an extra button before you can get to the login screen. Now you could argue that people don't need to log in for some of those options, so why make them? But those are edge cases. The majority of users are going to either want to log in to the app itself or generate a security code which also involves logging in. They've designed for the few at the expense of the many. 
Even the login is more complex than it needs to be. It requires a password of at least eight digits long, including both upper and lower case. Not to mention, of course, it needs to have at least one number. But what irritates me the most is the password box. When it finally does appear, you need to click into it before you can start typing, a totally unnecessary step. You might think that the first direct login is more secure, maybe, but to be honest, I think Barclays are smart enough to realize that that shouldn't be my problem. They promise that if any fraud happens via any of their online apps, they'll cover the loss. They'll so we'll stop there. He goes into lots of little details about specifically why uh, those little things bug him and why one maybe is a little less secure because it was more friendly, but his, his argument was for most customers, the friendliness outweighs the security problem. And they have a, they'll recognize by other ways whether it's, a, it's an invalid user. I've been to some websites where every time I go from a different computer, it makes me do some crazy things like validate my phone and everything. It's like, okay, I understand you're being secure. And maybe the bank has been convinced that if customers are seeing this security issue, they'll feel more comfortable going to the bank. Um, it hasn't been too bad a deal, but it's one of those little irritating things that really bugs my wife because she'll, she'll come in from a different PC. Or if you clear your cookies, it asks for all that stuff again. So let's get to a project now of you designing your interface. So if we go to our course and go to the case study, see what they want us to design. Basically, we want to lay out a prototype of our Tim's uh, web page or login screens. And in session eight, user interface input and output design. I'm going to concentrate on the user interface. Our prototype is going to be our our access forms. And the reason we're using access, it's not the greatest GUI interface designer, but it'll make it easy to interact with databases that we're going to be building as a background to this in our data design part. So access is an easy platform to do decent user interface design, which you can always use as a mock-up of then going to a more more operate or more developer friendly user interface design um, but access makes it all easily packageable together into a usable forms that link to each other like web pages would and then on the back side I can connect database concepts to my same forms so let's get a little refresher in building forms for access as we think like a user think about how we're going to uh, provide the initial design for the Tim's user interface they've given us switchboard information that we want there so they they want a switchboard design which basically is like one main page that takes you to these different areas for students, instructors, courses, course schedules, and course rosters. So I have my specified screens right there for me, which could take a lot of time, me coming up with myself. So it's nice to have, OK, here's what I want. Let's build an interface for this. As you come up with other screens, we can put that. But at least we've gotten specific instructions from our boss how to have a, first of all, we've given, we need one switchboard and then one screen for each of these. And just like they said, uh, get feedback from the first one before designing all your screens. Maybe do your switchboards and students and then 
come back and do these others because we want a common look and feel for the other ones such as uh, a OK button where you're going to put that when I'm done with something I'm doing or I want to go back to the previous page. We want to have those in a common location. And as we do this, we'll be refreshing our skills at using Access to design forms. So let's start up Access. Uh, I guess I don't have it started up. I better go find it. Come on, Access, where are you? Now I'm going to just start with a blank database. Uh, I found that if I try to use existing templates, I could get ideas from existing templates, but sometimes I get confused on how they did things and I spend more time trying to reproduce something than just doing it from, from scratch. So I'm going to start with a blank database. Uh oh, and I forgot to give it a name. I'm going to give it a name at the start. Blank database. There we go. Set a database tree. I'm going to call it Manning Tim's GUI. And I'm going to put it in my OneDrive. And now I go to create it. Not going to worry about my tables at this point, so I'm going to close my table and I'm going to come to create a form. And I'm going to jump right into form design. So this will be my Tim switchboard. And this is where you could use uh, PowerPoint to make some word art and copy paste it into here. For now, I can just uh, bring in some uh, controls. I'm going to use labels for my titles. Go to my design tab. Later on, I could bring in images in different places. I have radio buttons. I have oh, images with a object frame. I'm going to use object frames and, to group things together. But initially, I'll just start with some labels and some buttons that will take me to subpages. So this will be my Tim's switchboard. And I like some nice big text. And to get multiple lines, is it Alt Enter? No, Alt Enter doesn't give me multiple lines. I thought I could shift enter. Yeah, shift enter gives me a line feed. So training. And this is where you could pay someone to, to design a logo for Tim's. I can assign colors and I can enlarge my font with labels in access designer I can only apply a font size to the entire text I can not apply font size to individual but I'm gonna make that a little larger maybe that's a little too large and I'll make it bold if I want one text larger than the other I have to use two separate labels to choose two different font sizes I'm thinking I might want this bigger, so I'm going to cut that. I'm going to do another label of a bigger font for my... Uh-huh. So there's a label. Uh, oh yeah, select out of it, and then just select it so you just have the border highlighted. Then you can change its font. And I'm going to center the text on that, make that bold. 
Let's see, maybe I'll apply a light, slight amount of color there. Oh, I don't like brown. Let's try. Yeah, with, with access, when you make labels, you have to, you, to, to double click it, you can edit the text. When just the border is selected, you can adjust its font after selecting it. Then you can uh, font, adjust the font. You can select multiple things by just dragging a, a, a uh, selection area. As long as it's touching an object, it'll get selected. And I can turn off borders. For some reason, I like to have borders on by automatically. And um, where's my border? I can make it transparent border. So then I don't have these lines showing up. To see how the interface actually works, just come back to the Home tab and display the form view to see what it's going to look like. So there's what it would look like. Then I can come back to Form Design to adjust things some more. So if I turn on, if I put in a default label, and I'll call it uh, Select an Item, or maybe something more friendly. Where would you like to go? If I just use the default settings when I go to view, oh, I thought it would have a border, but I guess I guess labels don't have a border by default. Some items do, and that gets kind of irritating. I could say have some short instructions where you where would you like to go select your area or it may be obvious that it's just they need to select something. I'm going to I'm going to put that there just for now. Maybe get rid of it later on. And for a little graphical effect even though I don't need a whole lot. I'm going to can I insert a line? I'm just going to put a horizontal rule just to kind of separate my title from the switchboard and I'll make it a nice how do I adjust its colors I thought I could adjust their thickness nice wide rule and I always can I can always bop back to form view to see what it looks like. That's a little harsh. I might make that gray rather than a hard black. Maybe a blue since my title is blue. Now, since this is my main switchboard, I want to have an icon to go with each section. And remember the sections I've been given here in my case study, which I guess I left behind. Let me go back to my case study. Now for my switchboard, I just want to have how many icons? Uh, one, two, three, four, let's see. Five. Well, I'm wondering. Yeah. Well, a roster would be. Yeah, I'm thinking the Ross. I'm thinking the schedules would be under courses, and the course rosters would be under instructors. That yeah, instructors would want to see that. So I'm thinking actually, I might have those three on the main switchboard, and course schedules go under a subpage for courses, and rosters a subpage for instructors. That's what I think I would. I'm going to do. So. What would I do for a button? 
we can start with a basic button that would lead us to another form, and I'll show you how that's done. And eventually, I want to turn that button into a nice, maybe a little more user-friendly icon with a, maybe a face of a student. But let's see how that would work. Let's just say we want to create a page that would take us to a student's form. Because students are going to be our probably our main users here. So we could start out by first just putting in a navigation button and is it going to be that one? What do I have for ActiveX controls? Oh, I don't want to use ActiveX controls. Let's try a button. I have it set to, I have it turned on to use control wizards and I think, let's see if this will work for me. I'm going to try the, the, the button, come place it somewhere, and now it gives me a control wizard that lets me uh, choose some built-in record operations. So we don't want to go to record navigation. We want to navigate to a different form. So I'm going to use form operations, and I'm going to be opening a specific form, which will be my student subform. Now, if I were doing web page design, this would be create another web page for where this button takes me. But in Access, I can create forms on my pages. And then I can click Next for what form operation, and it gives me the choice of choosing a particular form, and since I haven't created any forms yet, there's nothing there to choose. So I'm going to do Next at this point, and I think I can come back and adjust what form gets open. Oh, it's not letting me do that. So if I want to use the wizard, I have to have a form available. Let's do finish and I can see if I can come back and get that button. Oh, it's not even going to let me finish my wizard. So if I cancel the wizard, I think it just leaves the button there for me to finish. Yeah. So I have a button there. The wizard couldn't find a form to open. We'll create our student form by first saving this one. So let's go ahead now and save this form and we'll come back and make a student form with just some generic here, you're at the student page for now, and then come back and adjust it. So let's save this, control S, give it the form. This will be our switchboard. So let's just call it Tim's switchboard, or Tim's main. I think I'll call it Tim's main. So now I have a form called Tim's main. Let's make another form and just put in a label student uh, Subpage, or how about just students? And then we'll we'll add to it, and so we'll just get our navigation to work. So I'm going to now do create another form, create form, and does oh sorry, I did the wrong one. Uh, I'll go to. I'm going to get rid of that. Ignore that. It made a Tim's main because I had this one selected. Let's go back to create form design. Not this will take this creates a form based on the th current thing I have selected. This gets me a whole different form, form design. And let's just put in a label here and let's make it nice and big. This is our students, so they know they're on the student page. And maybe I'll make it Tim's student. Tim's student page. And I, I select out of it, select just that object, and now I can format it, make it a nice big font. I'm going to center it in the box. And for now, that's my, that's my student form. Now I'm going to control S, save it, and I'll call this student. I know it's a form because it's in my forms category. Sometimes you'll see in some of the examples that these books provided, they say student form, Tim's main form. I get tired of the redundancy. But you're welcome to do that if you'd like. Okay, so there's my student page. When I'm here, I'm going to want to navigate back to the main form or go up a level. Uh, I don't know if Access has a way to go to the previous form that got me here. I think, I think it may. So now that we have two forms, let's go back to the Tim's main switchboard 
and see now if we can get this button to take us to the student form. So here's how that's done. I'm making room for a properties page. I'm going to right click properties of this button. And on the event, let's see if I can get this right. Under the event, on click, I want it to. Oh, I thought I could just get me to open a form. Maybe it, maybe the wizard will make it easier. I thought I could just get on click, open a form. Event procedure. I don't think I want that. Is there other? No, nope, I think I'll just I think I'll just delete this button and let the wizard help me first. Now that I know I have a form to go to, now when I do design add a button, now that the control wizard is there, I'll figure out what it does to make it open a form. So I go now to form operations, open a form, and now when I do next, it'll show me the two forms I have, and I want that to open my student form. And I'll just have I'll have a picture just to display. Let's see what pictures I have. I guess that's a picture it'll display. I could browse to have other pictures show up on that button. And that's how I can uh, uh, edit my look and feel. And I'm going to call this button uh, command. Uh, how about students? I'll just call it student button, student link. How about student link? And finish. So now let's view the form, my switchboard. Now it has a decent looking switchboard. I'd like to make this more than a just a simple form image. So maybe a picture of a student. But let's see if it works now. There it takes me to the student page. Now with access, there is a way to actually have this open up where the actual user will only see the forms and not all the design and object browser. And you could actually make a decent user interface just with access. But we're, and, but we're not worried about these forms. We're just making decent looking navigation pages. Now at this point, I would like a button that takes me back to the main switchboard. I know access enough to know if I close this, I get back to the uh, to the Tim's main form. And I can always go back to the student page, close it again. But for an average user, I'd rather have a nice, friendly, when I get here, another button says, take me back, or close, maybe just even a close button on my Tim's student page. Yeah. Yep. So let's make a let's let's see if we can make this a better icon here to make this a little bit more user friendly and just to show you how you can apply images to buttons. So I'm gonna go back to design view. And now I'll see how in the world they did this. If I see events here, I see they put something in here on click. Let's see if I can edit that. Look at that. In the on click it's a open a form of a named student. So I can actually edit the actions of that button. Where did you get that? I just went to the properties of that button and I looked at their on click event and I clicked the little ellipsis there and then it takes me to this access's way of applying actions to buttons. So rather than make you learn how to do this, we'll just let the wizard handle this. But that's something, if I want to explore actually what the wizard did, it'll, it added an action to that button. But if I want to change the picture on that button, I go to the format of it, under the format tab for properties, and I can apply the picture right here, and I can browse and choose a picture for that button. And it also gives me the choice of browsing to a picture. So I can go to the internet, or Google Images, and find a nice picture of a icon, or I can design my own picture of a student or uh, big letter S, 
uh, a pencil, some kind of icon that would be most obvious representing a student. I'm thinking myself a, a picture of someone studying would remind me of a student. But let's see what Google Images have for a picture. And then I'm going to download it to my uh, same folder, and I'm going to apply it to that button. So I'm going to go over to images.google.com. And I'm going to search for an image, uh, student, and I like the. I often will put the word cartoon in there, right? So I don't get artistics. So a student cartoon, or it could be study, and I get presentable images of student. Now this is a little, little corny looking, uh, but you can decide how how uh, playful you want your site to be. Cartoon generally takes you to kid-like cartoons. Sometimes they're not always kid-rated cartoons, so be careful. Oh, and I like the I like the uh, Snoopy. I think I'm gonna go with Linus. I think I'm gonna go with that one. So I'm gonna right-click. Actually. Usually if I go to the page, I get a better quality image. Oh, and look at that. It's a GIF, meaning that it's going to have some transparent background, which I like. So I'm going to save that image. I'm going to save it to my OneDrive, same location where I have my application. And I'm going to make a new folder, and I'm going to call it Kim's Picks. Just so they're not all cluttering my my CS412 folder. So now I have the image saved. I'll come back to here. And now when I choose my picture in my button properties, now I can go to browse over to where I saved that picture to. And let's see if it lets me do GIFs. I know sometimes it doesn't let you do anything but bitmap. Let's see what happens. Uh-oh, it looks like, let's see if it'll let me do all files. Let's see what it shows up. Looks like it's letting it show up, but it's huge. Yeah, that's awesome. But if I go to the, there's a way, I think. I might have to do an image instead. There's a way to control how the image gets stretched. Is there something to do with picture stretch I may not be able to do it with buttons. Buttons may only uh, take the full image and not be able to sh adjust to the size. Oh, So I'm going to do an image now instead so I can shrink it down to the size I want. And then I'll see if I can make it take me to a form. I think I can do that. But it looks like buttons don't let me stretch the image to fit the button, or actually shrink the image. Yeah. But I don't, I don't know if buttons will let you. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to go to design. I'm going to bring in a picture that I know I can also have navigate to a form. So I'm going to bring in a picture because I know I can stretch pictures and with that picture I'm going to bring it from my file, browse to my picture that I have on my OneDrive again. And it looks like I can create a link and let's see if it lets me choose No, I do want to embed it. I don't want to link to it. Let's see. And it's a GIF. But at least I can do inside. There it is. In size mode, instead of clipping, I can do stretch. That means it will fit to the size of my box. Let's see that if it will show it to me when I'm viewing my form. Oh, it doesn't like GIFs. 
I was hoping it would take gifts. Um, unbound object frame. Bound object frame. Let's try image instead of bound object frame. Maybe I used the wrong thing. Let's do image instead. There we go. Now the trick is when I click on it, can I get it to take me to the student form? So get rid of this. The button works, but it won't stretch. So I'm leaving the button there because I know that links. And I can always see how they did it in the event there. Let's see on this image if I can do on click. Let's try do a expression builder. Let's see if that'll let me. Um, Form. Is there an open form? Or a go to form? Oh, the events. Hmm. I'm not sure expression builder. Let's see if I can do a function that lets me navigate. Is there a navigation? All I want to do is open a form, and I'm there's like a go-to form, navigation button. Huh? Yeah, I'm 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 in the on click and trying to make it do something in the on click. Yeah, let's see. Can I do something else? How in the world did they get? Let's try the macro builder. Hey, maybe the macro builder is what I want. Let's see here. There we go. Go to form. Go to page. How did the button do? Was that a go to page? Did, did it? Navigate to. There we go. Navigate to. Object type. No. Oh, I'm just going to go back to how, I, how the button did it. So cancel. All right. Close that. Don't save changes. Let's see what they did for the button. It was a open form. All right, so let's go to this and see if I can do a macro builder. Is there an open form? Open form. There we go. Form name, student. And leave everything else default. Let's see if that does it. Save that. Close. View. And here it is. Look at that. It takes me to the student page. So playing a little bit with access, kind of bu building up your access skills. I now have an image. I added the I did the macro builder and I choose open form and then I can specify what form to open. And there's tons more actions I can apply to this image. So we'll finish there. But now I know how to make more buttons that then will navigate. And I'm thinking even though the icon makes it sort of obvious that that should be student, it wouldn't hurt to put a title student underneath there to make it clear to anyone that doesn't get it.
Well, basically, I want to initially just navigate to different forms. Uh, so the idea, the main homework is just designing the user interface. Okay, so so courses. Yep. And then on, in this, in the student page, we'll add a button that would pull up my transcript. Eventually, we'll see if we can actually get a a transcript data in there. But for now, we're just designing the the navigation pages. And refreshing our skills in the access or learning how to use the access designer. And it's not as user friendly as a lot of professional user interface design, but it's but it's something we have and it's easy enough to connect to a database in. The problem with those other things is you can design a great user interface, but then you need an API to connect to a database, and that's a big headache. Where here we're we're building in an access, making that connection a lot easier. 